Recently, authoritarian governments have had some trouble. Russia is struggling in its invasion of Ukraine. The Chinese Communist Party is facing highly unusual protests over its zero COVID policies. And Iran's regime has faced months of protests over its treatment of women. At the same time, there have been some encouraging signs that the illiberal forces in Western democracies are on the retreat. What does all of this mean for the future of dictatorships and democracies? Joining us to discuss is Francis Fukuyama. He's a senior fellow and political scientist working at Stanford and the author of several books such as The End of History and the Last Man, Liberalism and Its Discontents, his series on the origins of political order, and frankly, many other books. Dr. Fukuyama has written about how he believes liberal democracy is the final stage of human government, and eventually societies will trend more and more towards liberal democracy as they develop. What does he think about recent events and what they mean for the struggle between authoritarianism and liberal democracy? How did the authoritarian surge of the last decade take place to begin with, and is neoliberalism partially to blame? We discuss all of this and more in today's episode. As always, if you want to support us, you can join our Patreon at patreon.com slash neoliberalpodcast, or you can become a member of the Center for New Liberalism at cnliberalism.org. Enjoy the show. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Neoliberal Podcast, part of the Center for New Liberalism. I'm your host, Jeremiah Johnson, and my guest today is Frank Fukuyama. Frank, welcome to the show. Well, thanks very much for having me. All right. So I think the first thing we've got to do is, with all the stuff that's going on in the world, a lot of people have been bringing up the the book you wrote uh, several decades back uh, called The End of History and the Last Man. And that book has been widely read and probably even more widely discussed than it has been read, uh, which has led to a lot of misinterpretations. And so one of the first things I want to ask you about is kind of the difference between history, like I'm going to say lowercase h history, the, the one thing happens and then another thing happens kind of thing that you learn in school sometimes, and the idea of like capital H history as a process. What do we mean when we talk about history the way you talk about it in your book? Well, history with a capital H uh, is a synonym for a term like development or modernization. You know, it really refers to the broad process of uh, human societies evolving over time, you know, from hunter-gatherer to agrarian to uh, industrial and then to post-industrial societies. Uh, that's history with a capital H, you know, and there's a long line of thought in the West that that history is progressive, meaning that uh, you don't just cycle around, you know, so that, you know, we still have kings and queens and um, social structures that existed, you know, a thousand years ago, but we actually have changed the types of political institutions, and certainly we changed the nature of economic production over time, and therefore history has a certain direction, modernization has a certain direction. So that's the sense in which, you know, uh, uh, the term the end of history was used. It, actually, that phrase was not my phrase. It was something um, used first by the philosopher Hegel, uh, who is the real father of what's called historicism, or the view that history is progressive and that you have to measure uh, thoughts and actions with reference to the particular historical moment uh, in which it happened. Uh, and his phrase, the end of history, really had to do with and not in the sense of termination, but the direction of that historical uh, progress. And and was Hegel kind of the first person to really make this case for like, uh, for better or worse, I, I'm going to call it like a linear history. Like, I, I haven't read a ton of Hegel, but, you know, I, I know his theory of like the Weltgeist, the world spirit is kind of moving along this set path and we're going to end up in some idealized future that, 
suspiciously looks a lot like 18th century Prussia, where he was living. <laughs> but it, was he yeah. one of the first big names to kind of make this well, case that that it's like progressive in a sense? Yeah, uh, it, it kind of depends on how far you want to push things back. You know, Christian eschatology uh, speaks of history in that sense that, you know, the world is created um, in seven days uh, or in six days by God. And then uh, it progresses with, you know, successive revelations and the birth of Christ. And then uh, there's going to be an end of history when uh, everything will be resolved. You know, so in, in that sense, uh, deeply embedded in, in Christian worldview is a sense of a progressive history. Uh, there are thinkers before Hegel that uh, talked about this. Probably the most uh, important was Jean-Jacques Rousseau in the 18th century, uh, who speculated in his discourse on inequality about what you know we would call today primitive peoples were like. Uh, you know, peoples before the organization of states and large political structures, and that was a way of investigating. You know, what he called the state of nature, or what we might call human nature. You know, what are human beings like when stripped of all of the cultural uh, accretions that occur in the course of historical time? And his argument uh, was actually quite different from Hegel's. In a way, it was the opposite of Hegel's, that, uh, you know, early primitive human beings were actually happy uh, because they uh, could satisfy a limited number of needs. Uh, but what had happened over historical time was the accumulation of rules and norms and restrictions on human beings that basically destroyed that happiness. And so there was a history, uh, you know, you did have changes in human societies over time, but it was actually for the worse. And so modern man is less happy and less complete uh, than primitive man. So Hegel comes and turns that around and says, well, it was the opposite, that this has been progress. And I think, you know, the, the greatest popularizer of the idea of history is really Karl Marx, who took, um, you know, the entire Hegelian framework and uh, gave it a materialist uh, interpretation, uh, meaning that for him, history was driven ultimately by technology and by the material forms of production that produce different kinds of society, leading to capitalism, which for him was the penultimate a form of history. The end of history for Karl Marx would be, you know, some form of communist utopia. So there are many people that actually use this idea of history. And I think, you know, everybody implicitly believes in something like history. You know, I think um, Barack Obama had a phrase, you know, saying that you needed to get on the right side of history uh, because there was a direction to the way that people thought about issues like equality and democracy and so forth. I think there's a famous quote from Martin Luther King that says, like, the, the arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice. And, and that quote would kind of be an implicit endorsement of this idea that history moves in one direction, maybe maybe slowly, maybe in stops and starts. But there's kind of a direction that we're going in. Right. Mm -hmm. So this this is what I see, because. This book uh, kind of came out, and it, it was, a, a, I think, an essay first in, in some publication before it was a book. And it's around the time when the Soviet Union is collapsing, and we're entering this brave new world of democracy, and kind of liberal capitalism is very triumphant in that time period. And in the years since, there's kind of been this running joke that, you know, well, Fukuyama said history was ending, but look, things keep happening. Ha 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 ha. And we're not saying that, uh, apparently you know, it, events are never going to happen. There are never going to be momentous events in the future. But it's more like once we've hit this stage, liberal democracy, we're arguing there's not really a point past that. Is that kind of the, the key argument that you're trying to make? That's, uh, that's exactly it. You know, the Marxists for 150 years previously had argued that communism was going to be a higher stage of human history than, you know, democratic capitalism. Uh, and, you know, what I was arguing back in the late 1980s was that that simply wasn't going to happen, uh, that there was no obvious higher stage of history. And I think that that still remains the case. I mean, I think very few people 
really believe that we're all gravitating towards a Chinese kind of semi-capitalist, you know, dictatorship, or that uh, the Iranian Republic or the Islamic Republic in Iran represents a higher form of human social organization. Uh, and, you know, as long as that's true, it seems to me that there's a core of my argument that, you know, remains valid despite the setbacks that uh, we've seen to global democracy in the more than 30 years since I wrote the original essay. Yeah, it's. I, I want to get into kind of the 30-year the period since the original essay, but I want to take some time before we do that, because people have talked about, you know, in the last 30 years since the wave of democratization that happened when the USSR collapsed. Since then, people have talked about a democratic recession, that democracy has been backsliding a little bit, and they're worried about the future of democracy. But before we get into that, and exactly what's going on today and with like China and Russia and, and why maybe there's some hope. I want to talk about your book, Liberalism and Its Discontents. This is a book I read recently and thought it was a, a great book. But I also, you know, I, I am a self-described neoliberal and the book is potentially very harsh on neoliberalism as as a potential cause of some of the democratic backsliding or or the rise of right-wing authoritarianism. So I'd, I'd love to kind of have a conversation about that. Mm -hmm. And uh, and obviously, I'm going to be the one who sticks up for neoliberalism here. That's, you know, we're this is not a neutral podcast. I, I have my beliefs. <laughs> but but before before I get into anything, can you give the basic case for why did neoliberalism, in your view, somewhat contribute to or cause this kind of rising right-wing authoritarianism that we've seen over the last decade? Well, uh, first of all, you have to define neoliberalism. There are many parts of the world, like Latin America, where... That, that's a very tricky topic, by the way. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, so there are a lot of parts of the world, especially in the global south, where neoliberalism is simply a synonym for capitalism. And you have still uh, in you know, in that region, a left that hasn't really ever fully broken with Marxism, you know, that sees that capitalism itself as the source of all evil and social injustice. And so <clears throat> when Manuel Lopez Obrador, the president of Mexico, denounces neoliberalism, or Christina Kirchner in Argentina denounces neoliberalism, they're really denouncing capitalism and the market economy. And <clears throat> that's not the... Um, meaning that I have uh, used, you know, for me, neoliberalism is really the kind of what I would regard as the radicalization of economic liberalism that took place beginning in the late 70s, early 80s, that was associated with, you know, Margaret Thatcher in the UK and Ronald Reagan in the United States was very closely associated with, you know, the Chicago School, who were basically economists that believed that the state uh, played an overwhelmingly negative role in uh, economic life and that uh, frequently it was state intervention that, uh, it, you know, through regulation or state-owned enterprises or whatnot, uh, reduced uh, levels of entrepreneurship, innovation, and therefore economic growth. And under the, you know, tutelage of you know, this interpretation of economics, I think that, you know, what I would argue is that uh, you had a kind of unbridled uh, rise of market competition that correctly increased aggregate income, but it also produced these other uh, social effects in terms of disrupting, you know, stable communities, in terms of creating large uh, inequalities that were the largest in those countries that adopted neoliberal policies like the United States and the UK uh, uh, to the greatest extent that destabilized the financial system by deregulating it, uh, leading to you know multiple financial crises beginning in the early 1990s and kind of culminating with the subprime crisis in 2008. And I think that this had a malign political effect because you then have the growth in the second half of the uh, 2010s of populism, both of the Bernie Sanders variety and of the Donald Trump variety, both of whom, you know, purported to represent uh, 
working class people that had been hurt by globalization. Uh, and, you know, whether that's true or not, that was the perception and that was the issue that people mobilized around. So that's the sense in which it's not capitalism itself, it's not the market economy, but it's this kind of extension of market principles, you know, to uh, 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 an extent and in policy areas where it really wasn't appropriate that I think was the, the basic problem. I would fully agree in terms of citing the 2008 crash as a reason for, you know, political extremism to kind of go haywire. I, I think that, you know, obviously when you have the biggest worldwide recession since the, the, the world wars or since the Great Depression, then, you know, politics is going to get a little bit a little bit funky, I guess. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, though, that I would, I guess just my devil's advocate argument would be I'm not sure how much we can blame neoliberalism per se, because I look at this and I see kind of the same thing happening in so many different places around the world. You know, I, I see Duterte in the Philippines and Erdogan in Turkey and Bolsonaro in Brazil and Viktor Orban in Hungary and, you know, Trump in the United States and Brexit and a, a bunch of EU parties like Alternative for Deutschland and the National Front in in France and and you could even look at like in Japan it's kind of a softer version but like Shinzo Abe was definitely a, a right leaning nationalist even though he was much more sane I think than the people that I've been listing previously but I, I look at this and I see like so many people all around the world and it's kind of like was. Was neoliberalism in in all of those countries, or or is there some other factor that we're missing? That oh, I you know. think there are a lot of other factors. I think actually a lot of the populist backlash uh, in recent years is driven much more by cultural uh, factors than uh, economic ones. I mean, it's not it's not uh, economic inequality per se. I think that's driving populism. If that were the real cause, then you would expect. Uh, to see a lot more left-wing populism, right? Because it's the left that wants greater economic inequality. The left wants a bigger welfare state or more redistribution, more taxation of rich people. Uh, and and to be fair, you, you have seen a lot of people like, uh, you know, they haven't been as successful, I don't think, but the rise of Bernie Sanders, uh, Jeremy Corbyn in the UK, I, I think about like Mélenchon in um, in France, and D Linka in Germany, and they're not electorally successful, though, in the way the right wing has been. No, none of these people, none of these people are nearly as um, mobilized or successful as the right wing uh, populists. And I think the reason for that is that, you know, the motivation is only partly economic. Um, in fact, you know, Donald Trump got a lot of his rural southern base uh, riled up about Obamacare at the very moment when they were one of the, among the biggest beneficiaries of, of Obamacare, uh, you know, so that they were actually voting against their economic uh, interests. But that was because... And, and interestingly, he, one of his heterodoxies with GOP policy was that he said, at least during the campaign, he said, I'm going to protect your Medicare and Social Security. Anybody saying they're going to cut it is crazy. And he went instead, he went very conservative on the immigration culture war stuff. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's because those cultural issues, you know, are to some degree correlated with economic inequality, but not necessarily. And I think that those are the ones that, you know, really um, drove people to the polls. Uh, a lot of it had to do with the feeling that uh, the liberal world order had disrupted uh, you know, the kind of ethnic hegemony of, you know, the older working class. And that was certainly happening with high levels of immigration. Uh, so that people who had thought that they constituted the, you know, the core of their own, their country's national identity, all of a sudden saw themselves being displaced. Uh, there was a big gender element to this, because one of the things that's been happening in all economies is that as we switch from a manufacturing industrial economy to a, a a knowledge economy, you know, women have a much larger role in that. And so, you know, they've been graduating from universities at much higher rates than men. They've been displacing men in the workplace. Uh, and that also um, 
you know, I think drove a lot of the cultural backlash that you've seen against feminism, uh, uh, mm -hmm. you know, against, um, have uh, you read the, have you read the Richard Reeves book recently? Yeah, uh, no, I mean, he, he documents empirically a lot of, of, mm -hmm. of that, uh, you know, the, what's very interesting actually is that it's also true, not just in the United States and in Europe, it's true everywhere. So in the Persian Gulf, you know, what are we seeing in Iran right now? We're seeing basically a revolution that's being driven by women that don't want to be subordinated in a country which, you know, like in Europe and the United States, 60% of the graduates of Iranian universities are women. Uh, and so it's a kind of social change that, you know, you could say it's due to capitalism in, in this just this very generic sense that, you know, you let market forces play out and it turns out that, you know, you you don't need upper body strength in a, you know, in a high tech society. And so women have a much more natural place in the workforce. But then that turns out to be very socially disruptive because the men that are no longer providers in their families get very resentful and feel that, you know, this is something that's being done to them by a bunch of, you know, militant feminists, as opposed to what I think is the truth, which is, you know, it's just the result of technological uh, change and it's nobody's fault because you know we want to live in that kind of high tech world. Mm -hmm. And and one of the themes in in many of your bo books and and writings, I believe, it, it's been a while since I've read some of them, but you've talked about this kind of desire for recognition that humans are not just looking for a, a way to order society that makes them the richest, but something that gives them recognition and places value on who they are. And it, I could see this kind of tying into that argument that, you know, someone's traditional place has been disrupted and now they feel like their recognition is no longer valid or no longer special. And is that kind of similar no, to the point? That's right. Yeah. I mean, that's another complaint I have about modern economics because, you know, the um, uh, utility maximizing individual of the neoclassical model sees really two parts of the human psychology. There's the, you know, there's the part that has preferences, desires, that wants things, usually of a material nature. And then there's reason, which calculates how do I get, you know, the most of the things that I want. But there's a third part of the uh, human psychology that Plato talked about at some length. Uh, the Greek word for it was thumos, but you could call it the desire for recognition or for dignity, where we don't want something material like food or drink. What we want is the respect of other human beings. And oftentimes that drives people to a much greater extent than material desires, particularly in a modern, you know, post-industrial society where everybody's basic needs are pretty well covered. What they really want is uh, dignity or respect. And I think that's what powers nationalist movements who want recognition of their particular uh, nation. Uh, it's what's powered, I think, a lot of the, you know, the sexual politics in the United States where, you know, for many women that are, you know, suffering from sexual harassment, they're actually in the upper part of the income distribution. But, you know, they feel that they're not being respected uh, as human beings as opposed to, you know, being seen as as objects by men. Uh, it has a lot to do with the gay rights uh, and the gay marriage movement that, want respect uh, for, you know, gay couples, uh, the same as for uh, heterosexual ones. And so a lot of our politics, I think, does revolve around these non-economic issues that have to do entirely with the way that we, you know, value and respect each other as human beings. And one of the reasons that we, you know, I shouldn't even say we, one of the reasons you theorize that liberalism and liberal democracy could be the end of history, the end of the kind of this pathway that we're on, is that in a sense, liberalism kind of ends this struggle for recognition by equally recognizing all men and, and women that, you know, that we grant equal rights to people, everyone gets to vote, everybody is an equal in society, and therefore kind of, this kind of ends the, the classic struggle. But I, I guess, do you kind of see this struggle as like one of the struggle for recognition is one of like the inborn like just immutable facts about being human like the, the for you talked about this is goes all the way back to plato 
just for thousands of years across any different society? Is this just part of who we are that we struggle for recognition? And well, yeah, it's it's a part of human nature, a part of human psychology. Uh, you know what I argued all the way back in my end of history in the last man was that there's actually two types of recognition. Uh, one I labeled isothumia, which is the desire to be recognized as the equal of other people. And then there's what I called megalothumia, which is the desire to be recognized as superior. And both of those play out in every society, every human society. And so if you're not treated equally, um, you know, if your neighbor is given preference or somebody is uh, gets ahead of you online because of their skin color, because of their, their gender, uh, you know, you feel tremendous resentment and uh, anger at that, you know, that injustice. But there's also, you know, the desire to be recognized as superior to other people. It's not always bad. You know, you wouldn't have great sportsmen and women or, uh, you know, concert pianists or, you know, artists if you didn't have this kind of desire to be recognized as greater than. But it also can be expressed in terms of sheer domination of other people. In fact, that was really the form that megalothumia took throughout most of human uh, history, something that I think operated, uh, you know, very, very strongly in our, you know, um, in our last president who simply wanted to be recognized uh, not for quality, but just, you know, wanted to be the top of anything that he did, uh, regardless of whether that was good or bad. Uh, so, you know, it's an important driver of human uh, uh, mm -hmm. behavior. And I think the problem in a democracy is that we uh, we pledge to respect uh, isothumia. You know, we grant rights to all of our citizens and we promise to treat them equally. We don't in practice, but that's at least the promise. But there are a lot of people for whom that isn't adequate. You know, they want to be recognized for some other characteristic. It may be an individual characteristic, but oftentimes it's a group characteristic, like your race, like your, uh, you know, like your gender, like uh, your national origin. And, you know, that keeps us <laughs> stuck in, in history in a certain sense, because that's what a lot of historical conflict was about. It's such an interesting point about Donald Trump and kind of the desire for recognition, because... I feel like people who are not New Yorkers might not necessarily get this, but I think the entire reason that Donald Trump is the way he is, and, and I've lived in New York for a while now, is that the traditional New York kind of elite set, the socialites, the, the rich people, the elitists, none of them ever accepted Donald Trump. They always viewed him, no matter how much money he made, as this boorish, awful, detestable guy. And this is way before he was famous from The Apprentice, much less running for politics. And, and Donald Trump always hated it. He always really wanted to fit in. And he never did. He was always this guy that just couldn't hack it and they would never accept him. And it just ate at him. Yeah. And like, I, I think it's a real reason why he is the way he is. Well, there is one particular incident, uh, you know, at the White House Correspondents' Dinner uh, when Obama was president. Uh, so Obama was being roasted, but in the course of his talk, he made a lot of jokes about Donald Trump, you know, when Donald Trump was sitting there in the audience. And you can just imagine for someone like Trump, I mean, it was so humiliating to have the entire room laughing at him. Uh, he apparently slunk off. And I think that that actually, uh, you know, may have been what capped his desire to run for president, uh, is to prove all those people wrong. All right. So liberalism and its discontents was written kind of, I think, at a time when a lot of people were very worried about the, the state of liberalism in the world. And I think they were correct to be worried in that it certainly seemed for a hot minute like, you know, China is, is a lot more robust then we realized, and the CCP has this iron grip on their society, and Vladimir Putin is turning Russia into more and more of a, you know, autocratic state, and, you know, democracy seems to be in danger in, in a lot of previously rich liberal countries like the United States, and there's these kind of troubling movements everywhere, and that's kind of, it seems like that has to have inspired liberalism and its discontents 
to some extent. But my question is, how do you think things have changed in between when you wrote Liberalism and Its Discontents and the current day? Because boy, there's been a lot of news in the last year. Well, I think that things are looking better uh, at the end of 2022 than they did at the beginning of the year. Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't <laughs> get up and say that we're we're over the hump and everything's going to be okay at this point, uh, because there's still a lot of big illiberal forces acting. But you know, a number of things have happened that have been very encouraging if you believe in liberal democracy. So. In terms of geopolitics, there's been a real humiliation, I think, of the two big authoritarian great powers, Russia and China. Uh, you know, Putin thought that he could topple the regime in Kiev uh, when he invaded on February 24th within 48, 72 hours. And here it's uh, we're, we're about to close the first year of the war and the Ukrainians have pushed the Russians back uh, on all fronts. Uh, and the Russian army has proven to be, you know, massively uh, corrupt and, uh, and incompetent. In China, uh, they had been patting themselves on the back for having uh, kept COVID at bay. Uh, and many people in the West, uh, you know, back in 2020 or 2021 would have agreed that they'd done this miraculous job using their authoritarian power to enforce a zero COVID policy. But that's led to, you know, uh, an incredible outburst of protest. Uh, and it's really hurt the Chinese economy uh, tremendously to keep, you know, a third of their population locked up three years into the epidemic. And so now they're going to have to reverse course. Uh, the disease is going to get out. And I think their overall record is going to look a lot worse. And then finally, you know, in the United States, the specific threat posed by Trump and the MAGA wing of the um, Republican Party that were denying the legitimacy of the 2020 election, you know, had a real setback uh, on November 8th when um, virtually all of the election denying uh, candidates running in, in critical swing states were defeated. Uh, and many of, you know, Trump's personally endorsed candidates, most recent being Herschel Walker, uh, went down to defeat. And so I think that that kind of populist threat to our fundamental democratic institutions has, you know, been uh, deflated. Now, I wouldn't say that the situation is now fine and we're back to the, where we were 10 years ago because, you know, Russia still is dangerous and they're not defeated yet. Uh, China still has a lot of resources and economic power and you still have a third of Americans thinking the last election was fraudulent. And so, you know, all of these things have, uh, you know, the, 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 the momentum is broken to some extent, but I don't think that we're out of the woods yet. But, you know, I would say that, you know, right now I'm a lot more content with the state of the world than I was a year ago. I must say, you know, I, I was reading uh, The End of History and The Last Man in, in preparation for this, kind of going back through it. And I think you are a much stronger person than I, because if I had called some of the things that you had called, I would be doing victory laps in public, you know, just, <laughs> <laughs> you know, t touting this But But no, it was it was really almost a little eerie kind of reading this book from I think it was published, what, in, in 91 or 92 or something like yes. that. Mm -hmm. and, and some of the phrases and, and the, the turns of phrase that you were using just apply so perfectly right now, like one of my favorites, and it's only five words. But a, a persistent theme in the book is the weakness of strong states. You know, these states that we think of as strong, they're authoritarian, they can do anything they want, they can move very quickly, you know, the, the ruler has total power. They seem strong, but they are in fact quite weak and quite brittle. And like, I look at, you know, the, the CCP in China, and sure, they had the, the power to, you know, literally weld people into their homes to, to stop people from going out and spreading COVID. But the same person who has the power to lock you in your home also has the power to refuse to let you get a Western vaccine. Because one of the big issues there is that they, for, for nationalistic reasons, they absolutely refuse to use the mRNA vaccines that have proven so effective. They're only using the kind of the homegrown Chinese ones. And, you know, just looking at that kind of the, the weakness of strong states seems very prophetic to me.
I think that uh, people have to understand that there's good pragmatic reasons why we live in liberal democracies. If you vest all decision-making power in a single individual, the way uh, Putin and Xi uh, are the sole decision makers in Russia and China, they're going to make mistakes. And the mistakes are going to be much more catastrophic than if you live in a liberal society where you've got to get approval, you've got to consult, you have multiple checks and balances that uh, you know, force leaders to vet their ideas against you know, the opinions of other people. And I think with both the invasion of Ukraine and with zero COVID, that simply didn't happen. You know, Vladimir Putin, if you recall, was sitting at the end of a 30-foot table from his closest advisors because he was so afraid of getting COVID. And I think it symbolized his isolation from reality, where he thought that Ukrainians would welcome uh, Russian uh, troops invading their country. Uh, and similarly, you know, she has managed to upend collective leadership in China, which was one of the Communist Party's great achievements in the post-Mao era. He's the only decision maker, and therefore he has to own zero COVID, you know, lock, stock, and barrel. And, uh, you know, again, he's made a, a, a catastrophic error in doing that. Were you surprised at how fiercely the Ukrainians ended up fighting because it, it seemed like an unpopular opinion, even for people who were very anti-Russia, anti-invasion, they very much sympathize with Ukraine. It, it seemed very much like most people thought Ukraine might actually crumble. You know, that, that seemed like a reasonable belief, but instead the Ukrainians are fighting like crazy to preserve what they have. And, you know, it, it's interesting to me because Ukraine is a very young democracy and and still struggles with being a liberal democracy in many obvious ways. And I'm wondering, were, were you personally like taken aback, like how fiercely committed they seem to like, we don't want to be dominated by Russia. We want to continue this liberal democratic journey and maybe become part of the EU. Did that surprise you how just how much they were attached to that idea? It didn't surprise me that much. You know, I've spent a lot of time in Ukraine over the last eight years. Um, beginning in 2014, my center at Stanford started running a whole bunch of training programs for mid-career, uh, you know, uh, Ukrainian up-and-coming leaders. We brought some of them to Stanford. We went there and offered uh, leadership training courses. And so we've got you know, several hundred graduates of our different programs throughout Ukraine, many of whom are now playing critical roles in the defense of Ukraine. And it was pretty clear to me over that period how deeply committed, you know, a whole generation of young Ukrainians were to, uh, you know, the idea that they're living in a democracy, uh, that they want to be European, they don't want to be Russian. Uh, I think that you know, the, the surprise was a couple of things. I mean, one was just how bad the Russians were, uh, because even people that were very sympathetic to Ukraine sort of believed the hype about all the money that Putin had poured into Russian um, military modernization and the, you know, the, the quality of their new uh, technology and uh, leadership and this sort of thing. And that turned out to be completely completely wrong. And then frankly, is that is that another instance of the weakness of strong states? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, just in terms of military operations, the best armies in the world uh, uh, delegate authority to low levels, low command levels so that, you know, junior officers who are on the spot in the field can make decisions and have the authority to, you know, change plans when they see opportunities or or threats that the higher leadership doesn't see. And Russia, you know, retains this highly centralized authoritarian military structure where even small decisions have to be referred back to Moscow. And obviously you're not going to have a successful uh, strategy built around that kind of centralization. And so I do think that there's actually a link between you know, success on the battlefield and the kind of political um, uh, system that you have uh, domestically. Uh, and in that respect, you know, the Ukrainians really picked up on a lot of the training that they were given since 2014, developed this decentralized system, and then 
were willing to empower, uh, you know, uh, much lower level officials to, you know, to make decisions. The other thing about Ukraine that's really quite impressive is its civil society. Um, you have lots of people that organize spontaneously in Ukraine for all sorts of purposes, you know, for women's rights, for uh, for human rights, over judicial reform, anti-corruption, uh, a lot of different issues to make Ukrainian society, which was admittedly very defective in many ways uh, before the war, but, you know, those uh, those groups existed. And so, uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's very inspiring in many ways to see all of this come together in defense of their own you know, democratic sovereignty. One of the things that I was reminded of reading through End of History is your point that there are a surprisingly large number of cases where authoritarian governments just kind of voluntarily give up power. And, you know, there's this old adage, you know, people never voluntarily give up power, but that's very much not true. They very much do. And you see this in places like uh, in Chile, Pinochet had had this uh, vote of whether or not he should continue ruling, and he thought he was going to win, and he lost, and then he actually weirdly honored the results. You see this in a number of places throughout history. It, does this, I mean, I, I'm kind of reminded of Ukraine in this sense that, I, I guess in Ukraine it wasn't really voluntary, but there's, a, I don't know, just the, the spirit of people kind of insisting that they want liberal democracy, even when they're not living in a liberal democracy, seems very hard to tamp out. Uh, yeah, that's true. I think that um, the the problem is that there's also been authoritarian learning. And so, uh, you know, Gorbachev relaxed the rules in the former Soviet Union, and it ultimately led to a demise of the regime. I mean, that was the that was the amazing thing that we had all witnessed in the 1980s that culminated first in the collapse of the Berlin Wall and then the breakup of the former Soviet Union that, you know, this apparently strong empire simply dissolved um, uh, because of the early relaxation that then allowed people to express their, you know, real opinions. And so uh, the problem is that a lot of authoritarians learned from that particularly the Chinese. And I think that the Chinese said, this is why we really can't liberalize even to the smallest degree, because once you start letting people protest and, and gather and so forth, the thing is going to snowball and you're not going to be able to keep it under control. And so I think that they've been very vigilant in preventing, you know, another so-called color revolution occurring on their watch. On the other hand, you know, if you look at what's happened, um, they have had a mini color revolution in regard in, in reaction to zero COVID that's actually produced what for the regime is a fairly humiliating U-turn on, on, on the zero COVID policy. And so even in that situation, I do think, uh, you know, authoritarians are not all powerful and they do realize at a certain point that, you know, if everybody is against them, they can't keep cracking down. The really interesting one now is Iran. Uh, you know, it's been more than two months since Masa Amini was killed and these protests started. And uh, in previous episodes, the regime has been able to use so much violence that eventually, it, 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 you know, the protesters were simply overwhelmed. It hasn't happened uh, there yet. And there are signs that it's beginning to erode the solidarity uh, of the you know, the, the military forces that are behind the regime, that there are cracks in the clerical hierarchy and so forth. And so it may turn out that, um, you know, that's also a regime that is going to have to, you know, make compromises. One of the best things I've ever read about Xi says that basically the best way to understand him is that he is a Stalinist and not like in the Internet way where you accuse anyone on the left you don't like of being a Stalinist. But that actually, like he thinks, the entire problem with the Soviet Union was that they went away from Stalin's tactics and they got too soft, and then they eventually fell apart. You know, the, the Gorbachev got too soft theory, um, and that he's kind of vowed not to do the same thing. And yet, it, it makes me wonder. You know, have have the dictators put together a playbook? You know, it, it, have they learned from these episodes of you know the Soviet Union breaking down and? 
have they got now the the postmodern playbook for controlling the flow of information you can see you know putin banning any sort of uh, independent media in russia victor orban is you know gobbling up all of the independent press in hungary and you know kind of inf having elections but having them be strongly influenced elections and gerrymandered and semi rigged elections and i, I wonder like do you think that this model that they're trying to build is potentially more stable than the previous model of of whatever existed before for for these dictators. Uh, well, yeah, that argument was uh, made most recently by um, uh, Sergei Guriev, who just uh, published a book about uh, you know kind of postmodern uh, dictatorship, in which he uh, you know essentially said that. There's a new form of dictatorship that isn't Stalinist. I mean, Stalin just killed everybody, you know, including a lot of people that were working for him just to terrorize uh, people. But the postmodern ones don't do that. They use uh, information and the Internet and you know more subtle tactics to stay in power. Uh, I'm not sure that that's going to be so durable in the long run. Uh, you know, Russia has turned from being a postmodern dictatorship to being just a dictatorship uh, that's willing to use violence and force, you know, in order to keep itself going. Uh, China may turn in that direction uh, uh, also. Uh, but, you know, I think there's a broader point where a lot of times authoritarian government simply isn't a stable, sustainable form of government because it's rigid. You know, you 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 can't hold leaders accountable, you can't change them easily. And so either they, uh, you know, they, they undermine themselves, which is what happened in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union, or they get tougher and tougher, but then eventually that explodes because they can't simply use violence indefinitely to keep themselves in power. Uh, and so I think we're seeing both kinds of weaknesses appear in authoritarian regimes, you know, as we speak. One fairly popular theory of geopolitics, I guess, and it kind of combines politics and history and economics, is that as a country gets more and more economically developed, they are more and more likely to become a liberal democracy. Is this something that you believe? And if so, what do you think are the causal factors there? Because people speculate about a lot of different reasons this could be. Well, you know, this is classic modernization theory, this uh, idea that as people become richer, better educated, uh, that their political opinions tend to become more liberal. Uh, they're exposed to, you know, more outside forces. They, you know, do occupations that require connections with other parts of the world. Uh, they learn a certain degree of critical thinking, and therefore they're willing to challenge, you know, existing sources of authority. And I must say, I believe that pretty strongly when I wrote The End of History and the Last Man, you know, the big uh, contradiction has been China. The idea was that once a country developed a, a large enough middle class, that that middle class would start pushing, if not for democracy, at least for liberalization uh, under these kinds of pressures. That happened in South Korea, it happened in Taiwan, in Japan, and other Asian countries, but it did not seem to be happening in the largest Asian country, China, where, as far as we could tell, there was a lot of um, support for the regime among precisely those middle class people that had been made rich and secure uh, by the Communist Party. Uh, but maybe maybe we gave up on you know, we gave up on that theory a little bit prematurely because, you know, the, the regime hadn't been tested uh, economically. You know, we've been talking about COVID, but the other big disaster that's unfolding in China is the economy. Uh, you know, the Chinese economic model that's largely state-driven had been, uh, you know, producing double-digit rates of growth uh, over a period of decades. And then a few years ago, it began to fall to six seven, you know, five percent. And now uh, a lot of my economists, China economist friends, think it's actually negative, uh, which is unprecedented in the entire period through 19, uh, 
from 1978 on. Uh, and so all of a sudden, you know, you have youth unemployment, uh, generation, a whole generation of Chinese people or young people are graduating from universities with very poor job prospects. And it could be that when you combine a uh, sort of modernization theory with adverse economic conditions, maybe it'll turn out that that is a toxic combination for authoritarianism and that people will start demanding you know, greater political freedom. So we'll have to see. What do you think causes that process, though? Is it is it a personal factor, like the more educated you become? Or is it is it something more grand about like on the level of a civilization? There's just some factor about getting rich that forces everyone to acknowledge democracy or? I don't think that there's a consensus on this, but there's several possibilities. You know, one old theory had to do with property rights that, uh, you know, if you're a poor peasant living on the verge of starvation, uh, you don't really have any stake in the system. And therefore, you can sign up for a Marxist party or a guerrilla organization because you've got nothing to lose. But then when you become a middle class person with a house or a condo or, you know, uh, an automobile, uh, you suddenly want to protect your property and you want a government that's going to be more uh, protective of it. Uh, you know, that's one possibility. The other one has to do with education that, uh, you know, part of what you get when you get a higher education is you can start thinking for yourself. You know, that was really the argument about why the Protestant Reformation was so closely tied to economic uh, modernization and then the growth of modern liberalism was that at the core of Protestantism was literacy because, you know, the Protestants wanted every individual to be able to read the Bible and not depend on the priest to interpret the Bible for them, which in any event was being, you know, read in a, in a different language that they couldn't understand. But with Protestantism, everybody all of a sudden could read the Bible directly and they didn't need these intermediaries. And that produced, you know, the kind of individualism that is at the core of a liberal society and at the core of a, of a modern society. So, you know, that might be another mechanism that as people uh, are better educated, they, you know, they learn to think more independently than, you know, their, their parents or their uh, grandparents. And so, you know, there's a lot of other possible routes by which you could get this connection between wealth and the desire for freedom, but I think those may be some of the, you know, some of the most important. All right, we've got just a little bit more time, maybe time for a couple more questions. And so I want to look towards the future. We've seen this period of triumphalism where, you know, it looked like Soviet Union is collapsing, liberal democracy is going to win forever. We, we've seen a kind of democratic recession in, since that time in the, you know, decades since. And recently, we've seen potentially some signs for hope, or at least some signs of weakness in some of the large authoritarian states. I'm not going to ask you to do a prediction, because the predicting the future is impossible. But what are some of the things you'll be watching, at least, over the next five to 10 years, in terms of some of these great questions? Will Russia you know, stop being a, a dictatorship? Will the Communist Party of China continue to hold on to power? What are the things you're going to be watching? What are the indicators that you're looking out for to see whether or not this kind of wave of liberal democracy can continue to grow, whether we might have like a third or a fourth wave of liberalization? Well, some of the indicators are pretty obvious ones. I mean, one has to do with geopolitics. You know, if, uh, if Russia manages to reverse its early defeats and actually uh, uh, start winning uh, in Ukraine. That's going to be an important uh, negative uh, sign of how things are going. If China decides to invade uh, Taiwan, that's going to be a disaster for everybody. It's going to be a huge setback, not just for democracy, but for the global economy and then all the institutions that rest on that. So, you know, those are some pretty obvious ones. I think one of the things that's worried me and a lot of other people uh, is American politics. Uh, you know, I really never expected to see such a large number of Americans vote for, you know, an obvious kind of shameless uh, and corrupt demagogue. Uh, 
as our past president, and yet they did, and you know, there's still a lot of people that support him. And so if in the next few elections there is a continued move to reject that kind of politics, I think that's also uh, a very good sign. And then I guess the final thing, maybe this is just the vanity of an intellectual, but I do think that you know, you can't have a survival of a uh, liberal democracy if people don't appreciate what that system is all about. And on the level of ideas, if there's too much self-doubt and, you know, self-criticism of liberal societies, it isn't going to be able to sustain itself. And so I think that, uh, you know, there'll be a lot of ideas, there'll be a battle of ideas. You know, right now there's this so-called national conservative movement that's trying to fill in because, you know, Donald Trump himself or Steve Bannon are not theorists. They don't have a, you know, they haven't been sitting in, a, in the British Library for the last 30 years trying to write up their ideas. Uh, they're, they're just, you know, putting things into practice. And so there's been an effort to fill in for them. Uh, as there has been in Russia, I mean, you, you are, are you get, talking about some of the like Adrian Vermuli and, and yeah, Sorab yeah. Armari and some of those guys with the, the post liberal crowd, post -liberal, so yeah, speak. Patrick Deneen and so forth. So they're trying to come up with, you know, a more serious highbrow uh, set of ideas to justify, you know, Trumpist policies. But it's been happening in Russia too. This guy Alexander Dugin uh, uh, and other Russian nationalists have been trying to you know, provide ideas for Putin uh, to justify what he's been doing. And I think in the long run, these become important. You know, if you think about, just to get back to the subject of neoliberalism. There's an old, there, there's an old um, adage, you know, we're all slaves to some defunct economists' ideas. That's right. That's right. And you're, you're saying the same thing goes for philosophers and political scientists and historians. Yeah, that's right. I mean, just to go back to neoliberalism, if you didn't have Nobel Prize winning economists like, you know, Milton Friedman and Gary Becker, George Stigler, all, you know, writing in a very highbrow way, defending these ideas, I don't think that it would have been the successful movement that's challenged and changed policy to the extent that it did. And so I do think that these ideas do, you know, play out over uh, over time. So that I guess that would be the, you know, the third big indicator that I would look at. All right. Well, we're coming up on time now. So we're going to ask the traditional final question that we always ask in this podcast. And that is, what would you recommend for people who want to learn more? This could be things for them to read, things for them to watch, uh, anything that you think would be helpful for the ideas that we're talking about today, whether you want to recommend books or, you know, uh, particular articles or blogs that are really good to read. I will start out by recommending, of course, everyone should go pick up a copy of The End <laughs> of History and the Last Man by Francis Fukuyama. Um, we get Frank's other books um, like uh, Liberalism and Its Discontents. Um, we, we did not get a chance to talk about some of your other work, like the Political Order series, which is actually my favorite thing that I've ever read of yours. You know, we'll, maybe we'll have to have you back one day to talk about the Political Order series. Um, but other than your own books, which I am very happy to recommend myself, what else would you recommend for people who are just interested in this subject and who want to learn more? Uh, well, it's interesting. Uh, a number of people have stepped up to try to defend centrist policies um, and have started, uh, you know, uh, kind of online uh, magazines. So I, I was responsible for helping to create one of them, which is called American Purpose. AmericanPurpose.com. I have a blog on that uh, website, but we are trying to, you know, defend liberalism and a liberal world order. Uh, in particular, uh, Yasha Monk started a, a, you know, a journal, uh, more than a journal, it's kind of a society called uh, Persuasion. Uh, Sheikha Dalmia uh, at the Mercatus Center has uh, launched something called the Unpopulist. Uh, and so, you know, uh, there's a bunch of people that form the bulwark. These are former conservatives who turn, you know, uh, decidedly uh, anti-Trump. Uh, and they've been writing a lot that really kind of occupies the liberal center of American politics right now. 
So I think these are all good sources for kind of day-to-day. -day. I mean, it operates on several levels. So part of it is a more kind of theoretical level, but part of it is kind of the day-to-day -day politics, which I think if you don't pay attention to, you know, it's going to come to bite you uh, down the road. Uh, so I think all of those are good sources. If I can just make one plug, I have, a, you know, my blog on American Purpose called Frankly, Fukuyama, I just started a YouTube channel with the same title. So you're welcome to, you know, to subscribe to either of those. We will make sure to link those in the show notes. Anybody who's interested, we'll have links there. So just click on the show notes and they'll be right there. Um, th this has been a real treat for me. I've, I've loved reading a lot of your work, Frank. And I, I can't count how many people I've had on the show who told me like, oh, you, you need to get you need to get Frank on the show. Like, he, he would. He's great. He wants to talk about all these things. So I'm glad we were finally able to do it. Well, I am too. Um, well, I, my guest today has been uh, Francis Fukuyama, author, historian, political scientist. Frank, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Good. Thank you very much.